And so before we continue to search and study our inheritance in Jesus Christ, the unchanging epigraph of our study of the Word of God is Luke 24, 44. Then Jesus said to his disciples, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And for us as partakers of the body of Christ to share with Christ the fulfillment of all that is written about him in Scripture, we shall continue our study of our collaboration with the Holy Spirit and what is necessary to be done from our side so that we can receive the right to the power to put off our former way of life and put on the new form of life that is in to Jesus Christ and his resurrection to put off our former way of life that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness Ephesians 4 22 through 24 to fulfill this command we as we know we need to utilize three charging and fundamental verbs these are put off be renewed and put on and to confirm the given promise, elevated in status of a commandment, we will read another place of scripture. This place is written by the same author. There are a lot of places of scripture, but this place, written by the same author in a little bit of a different format, identifies a similar truth, calling us to take off the old man with his deeds so we can put on the new man. This is Colossians 3, 8 through 14. But now you yourselves are put off to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him where there's neither Greek nor Jew circumcised nor uncircumcised barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free but Christ is all and in all therefore as the elect of God holy and beloved put on tender mercies kindness, humility, meekness long-suffering bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Colossians 3, 8-14. It's talking about the change of character to dress in to a different character. But when it's talking about the new person, then this new person, aside from character, also has a boundary or somewhat of so our body is that boundary and it will have this as a frame we've noted that specifically our decision regarding these three destiny affecting words to put off be renewed and put on will determine whether you transform yourself into a vessel of mercy or a vessel of wrath or more specifically will the completion of our salvation happen that as we know is given to us in the format of a guarantee or will we lose it and our names be forever blotted out of the book of life, although they may have been written there at one time. In a specific format, we've already looked at the first two questions and have been studying the third question. What conditions are we to fulfill so that by the means of an already renewed mind, we begin the process of dressing ourselves into the power of our new person that is created in accordance to God in Christ Jesus in righteousness and holy truth? When speaking about clothing ourselves into the power of our new person that contains the power of the resurrection of Christ, we've concluded that we need God's help, that is, we need His mercy. The means of receiving any kind of help from God, which we see as the inheritance of the mercies of God, is weaponry of prayer or worship, worship in spirit and in truth. Since prayer isn't just a man's means of communicating with God, but also a kind of legal and sacral right that a man gives heaven, a tool that activates the given law of God, man gives heaven this right so that heaven may intervene upon the earth. 
Relevant to this is one of the prayers of David, written in the 143rd Psalm. It very clearly opens for us the conditions, the grounds upon which a person is called to prepare a legal foundation for God, so that God would intervene with his mercy into his life, as well as the aspects and boundaries that we rule over and carry responsibility for before God. It has become the component of our study. Let's read and submerge into the beauty of this psalm that has become our prayer. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. In your faithfulness answer me, and in your righteousness. Do not enter into judgment with your servant. For in your sight no one living is righteous. For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in darkness like those who have long been dead. Therefore my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is distressed. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I muse on the works of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a thirsty land. Answer me speedily, O Lord, my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, lest I be like those who go down into the pit. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you I take shelter. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake, for your righteousness' sake. Bring my soul out of trouble. In your mercy, cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul, for I am your servant. For David, as well as for us, to hear the mercy of God, when it says early, that means the resurrection to hear. That means to be dressed into the new person so that we can be dressed into this new person. As we've previously noted, we have had looked at 10 unique in their nature arguments identifying the right to enter the presence of God founded upon the laws of God, which is the word of God that came out of the mouth of God, that God is magnified above all his name and that he willingly submits to. Specifically, these ruling and mighty words of God converted into promises and commandments for man, David presented to God as the consistency of his heart, saying to God, hear me in your faithfulness and your righteousness. Hear me because I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. Hear me because I spread out my hands to you. Hear me for in you do I trust. Hear me because I lift up my soul to you. Hear me because in you I take shelter. Hear me for you are my God. Hear me for your name's sake. Hear me for your righteousness' sake. And hear me for I am your servant. <coughs> In the previous services, we had already studied the nature of the first argument that abided in David's heart. This was evidence that faithfulness and righteousness abided in David's heart. This served as legal grounds for God, giving God the ability to hear David and to stand on the side of David in his oppositions against his enemies. And we stopped to study the second argument. This is the presented by David evidence. And so his enemies, again, were his house, his, his nation, his house, and his corrupt desires. David had the same enemies we have today. <clears throat> the second argument is the presented by David evidence that in his heart, the memories of the days of old were imprinted and all the deeds that God had done in those old days. Based on the revelation of the Holy Spirit, we began to study the form of this evidence in the breastplate of judgment of the high priest. This item is a unique and is a continual memorial before God, identifying with itself continual prayer. The breastplate of judgment was created and served only one item. This was the urim and the thummim within the heart of a man, the presence of which allowed God to hear man and allowed man to hear God. Therefore, to be heard by God in the revelations of his Urim, the revelation of the Holy Spirit, or the Urim is the Holy Spirit, it was necessary to keep with your, within your mind the works of God that is his thummim that he had done in the days of old, the teaching of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh. 
то есть которые я он изложил, совершил уже, ратифицировал. Which the Lord has confirmed and had done in the days of old. The breastplate of judgment as a continual memorial before God is a sacral symbol of the format of continual prayer, providing God grounds to fulfill His will upon planet Earth. Therefore, prayer that does not satisfy the requirements and characteristics of the breastplate of judgment does not have the right to be called prayer. As only the format of continual prayer presented in the breastplate of, of the high priest gives us the right to come close to God and enter into the holy place as a king and a priest to God to present intercession that pr pursues the interests of his will. Here's how Apostle Paul presents the nature of the breastplate of judgment symbolizing continual prayer in his books. Colossians 4.2, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Continuing earnestly in prayer identifies a joyously burning lamp, identifying the condition of the righteous heart of a man. The light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out, Proverbs 13.9. When it's talking about fire, it's talking about the life of God. Our lamp, our spirit can burn while there, the life of God is there. The order in which the breastplate of judgment was built identified and enjoined the demands of spirit and truth that the true worshippers of God, whom God seeks, needed to be in accordance to and need to possess. John 4, 23, 24, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. These words Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well of Jacob. And somehow the Holy Spirit told the disciples about this conversation because when the disciples came, he was they were surprised he was talking to this woman. They brought food and they said, Rabbi, eat. And he said, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. A food uh, that you do not know. If the building order of the breastplate of judgment is interfered in any way, the breastplate of judgment loses its nature and its purpose. The breastplate of judgment identifies the state of the heart of a worshiper of God. <coughs> And so his spirit then, his temple stops being the temple of God and <coughs> becomes the den of robbers. Worshipping the Father in spirit and in truth includes not peddling with the truth when pursuing the goals that God has placed in Scripture, as people have done at all times and many do today, because of their stiff neck and to benefit their greed and their hypocrisy. For we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God we speak in the sight of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians 2.17 Not many pastors today allow uh, themselves to speak, uh, preach with sincerity. They are afraid of specific truth of specific truths. They uh, are afraid of speaking these things because they're going to lose either people in their church or other things. In the Septuagint, the breastplate of judgment is called the sign of justice, as by the means of the Urim and the Thummim, as by the means of the Urim and the Thummim that is contained in the breastplate of judgment, God revealed to man his judgments. The breastplate of judgment is identified as the conscience of a man purified from dead works upon the tablets of whom just as assign it and the twelve names of the patriarchs, the teaching of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh is imprinted. A conscience purified of dead works with the imprinted faithfulness and righteousness upon its tablets is called to give God the right to function in them and through them upon planet Earth. In a specific format, we have already looked at the measurements and nature of materials with which the breastplate of judgment was built that we are called to be in accordance to within our spirit and stop to study the next requirement that shows these words, Exodus 20, 17 through 21, and you shall put settings of stone in it, four rows of stones, the first row, sardius, topaz, and emerald, second row, turquoise, sapphire, and diamond, the third row, jacinth, agate, and amethyst, and fourth row, beryl, onyx, and jasper. 
They shall be set in gold settings. And the stones shall have the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names. Like the engraving of a signet, each one with its own name, they shall be according to the twelve tribes. We've noted that the twelve golden settings is the authority, rule, and order of the Word of God, contained in the teaching of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh, that we as worshippers of God are called to present within the foundation of our continual prayer. When we ask anyone according to his will, we receive, and in accordance to his will is in accordance to these twelve Mounts, the twelve precious stones with engraved upon them as a sign and names of the sons of Israel, is a symbol and format of our continual prayer presenting the perfect judgments of God. From this we can see that it wasn't the golden settings, being the truth of the word of God, that were adjusted in measurement and configuration to fit the precious stones, but the precious stones themselves, being our prayers, are the ones that were adjusted and configured to fit the golden settings of truth. We need to prepare our prayers, make our prayers in such a way that they in measurement and configuration would be exactly in accordance to the twelve teachings of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh. Continual prayer in the twelve precious stones of the breastplate of judgment with the twelve names is a persisting prayer that in its intercession presents the interests of the will of God and does not sway away or step away from the goal until what is asked for is received. Building of the breastplate of judgment within our heart is revealed as building the kingdom of heaven in the image of the tree of life. Growing the tree of life within your heart is building yourself up into a new person, created in accordance to God in righteousness and holy truth, into a spiritual house and a holy priesthood. With this we note that all of the beauty and order of the temple was created for one holy item and served that one item, this was the golden ark of the covenant. The same thing with the ephod of the high priest with the connected to it breastplate of judgment. It was created for and served only one holy item. This item very accurately was called to duplicate and fulfill the function of the golden ark. This was the urim and the thummim that is the Holy Spirit and truth, because the golden ark of the covenant as well as the breastplate of judgment symbolize from different angles and with various purposes the conscience of a man cleansed from dead works. The Urim and the Thummim in Hebrew mean light and perfection. Light, that is, the Holy Spirit, perfection is the truth. Light and the right, light is the Holy Spirit, the right is the truth. Revelation and true revelation is the Holy Spirit and truth is the one that he reveals in our heart. The Ten Commandments inside the Ark of the Covenant that actually represents Christ because he is the Word of God is the truth, and this truth upon the breastplate of judgment is the Thummim, the revelation that a person could receive at the lid of the Ark, the mercy seat, of, is the Urim in the breastplate of judgment. These were symbols, but it wasn't actually the Urim and Thummim that responded, but the Holy Spirit that responded when they, when they came to pray. Because when David put on the ephod, then if the Urim and the Thummim were there, but he didn't have the Holy Spirit in his heart, then he would not have been able to hear anything through the Urim and the Thummim. You remember that God did not respond by the Urim and the Thummim. The priest would put it on and then go to God. The Urim and the Thummim is a symbol of the Holy Spirit and the truth in the heart. If you don't have the Holy Spirit and the truth in your heart, whatever you may put on yourself, whatever you may be anointed to, whatever rank you may have, God will be silent. And so it's not important what your rank is, but what's important, does your heart have the Holy Spirit? Is he the Lord and Master of your life? And the truth, is it first in your life or not? And so only a person who has a conscience cleansed from dead works or who has a wise heart upon the tablets of whom the truth in the form of the thumb is imprinted can be a worshiper of God. You may say, but the teaching of Jesus Christ didn't exist at that time. It was. It was called the teaching of Judaism at the time, the teaching of redemption, being born again. It did exist. 
И вот я в сердце всякого мудрого вложу мудрость, дабы они have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans that they may make all that I have commanded you. Exodus 31:6. God places his wisdom into a wise heart. If there is the truth there, then that means it's a wise heart. If there's no truth, then this is a foolish heart. And so when we're talking about the truth, understanding the truth, the faith teaching, if we are presented the wrong faith teaching or a partial truth only a, or a false teaching, then we will remain foolish. To be wise, we need to hear the full, revealed, opened up truth in its fullness, to understand it, to comprehend it, to receive it, to eat it. We know that the friendship of the Thummim and Urim in the heart of a person is a unification of two formats of wisdom, which state that the carriers of the Thummim and the Urim are true worshippers of God and possess the immune system of the Holy Spirit. And of Levi he said, Deuteronomy 33, 8-11, Levi is the destiny of every worshipper of God, a warrior in prayer. Let your Thummim and your Urim be with your Holy One, whom you tested at Massa and with whom you contended at the waters of Meribah, who say of his father and mother, I have not seen them, and nor did he acknowledge his brothers or know his own children, for they have observed your word and kept your covenant. People who have binded themselves to the Lord, to the Holy Spirit, they are led by the Holy Spirit. They shall teach Jacob your judgments and Israel your law. They shall put incense before you and a whole, whole burnt sacrifice on your altar. Bless his substance, Lord, and accept the works of his hands. Strike the loins of those who rise against him and of those who hate him, that they rise not again. When it's talking about the fact that they could not rise again, it says stand uh, in the freedom or liberty that the Lord has uh, given you. When it says stand in liberty is to be dead to sin. But to fall means to be dead to righteousness and living for sin. And so when people do not want to be servants of righteousness and are servants of sin, they experience an unusual freedom inside because they're no longer servants of righteousness. They say, oh, there we were in servitude. There's dictatorship there. They don't know of what slavery and dictatorship they actually fell into. When they end up in hell, then they will find out. <clears throat> what kind of freedom they fell into. Yeah, they're free from the serv uh, from servitude to righteousness because they're servants of, of sin. In a specific format, we have already looked at five qualities of a warrior in prayer in the first five precious stones of the breastplate of judgment by which God was able to continuously reveal his will upon planet Earth and stop to study the sixth quality and the precious diamond stone. We <coughs> are, are upon this subject for a while now because we're studying the quality of prayer itself in all of its... It, and uh, these, uh, this quality of prayer actually applies to all of the stones. We know now that the sixth name carved upon the precious stone of the breastplate of judgment upon the tablets of our heart is the name of the sixth son of Jacob, Naphtali, which means wrestling one that prevails in prayer. And Rachel's maid Bela conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, with great wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister, and indeed I have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. Genesis 37, 8. The name of God presented in the precious diamond stone Every stone uh, presented a specific name of God. God has a lot of names and titles, and every precious stone demonstrated a specific name of God. So the precious diamond stone, according to the Jewish rabbinate, is El Hai in Hebrew, which when translated means God is alive. Therefore, according to the definition of the name Naphtali upon the precious diamond stone, we can conclude that the function of the sixth principle as a format of continual prayer is our right and our ability to allow the Holy Spirit to abide with us in our prayer battles against the powers of hell which confront us when we fulfill the will of God by the name of the living God.
это все и выполнить волю Божию в этой борьбе. To prevail and fulfill God's will in that process. Jeremiah 10:10. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At His wrath, the earth will tremble and the nations will not be able to endure His indignation. The name of the living God is the format of an oath, and the category of the nation that had not learned to swear by the living God or swore falsely were utterly destroyed. <clears throat> Jeremiah 12, 16, 17. And it shall be, if they will learn carefully the ways of my people to swear by my name, as the Lord lives, as they taught, me, taught my people to swear by Baal, then they shall be established in the midst of my people. But if they do not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, says the Lord. Therefore, to not be plucked up and destroyed by the wrath of the living God, it is necessary to learn the ways of the nation of God, to swear by the name of God El Hai, or by the living God. These ways are the paths of the commandments and statutes of God. The conditions that give us the right to learn the ways or paths of God's commandments and statutes, to swear by the name of the living God, is the thirst to know them. Psalm 119, 32 through 35. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart when my heart will begin to bear fruit. <clears throat> Teach me, O Lord, the ways of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. We know that in Hebrew, God, being alive or living, is one who abides, one who is with unconditional authority, one who defines a genesis, who creates a genesis, holds a genesis, keeps a genesis, rules over the genesis, and commander and lord of the genesis. Deuteronomy 10, 20 through 21. You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him, and to him you shall hold fast, and take oath in his name. He is your praise, and he is your God, who has done for you these great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. You remember in Matthew there's such a place of scripture that talks about not swearing by anyone, do not swear by heaven or earth or by your own head. Why? Because people stopped swearing by the name of the living God and began to swear by their own head and sometimes uh, swear by the Bible. I've and I see he just lied and places his hands on the Bible and says this is the truth. They think that if they put their hand on the Bible, this is an oath. No, to swear by the name of the living God, if you uh, swear falsely, you will be destroyed. Mm -hmm. If you remember, Elijah said, and there will not be rain in all these years, in the latter years, until I give the word, and it happened so. And so the power of a warrior in prayer contained within the virtue of the name of the living God is called to present the unlimited power of God over the genesis in the allotted by him for us, time and boundaries. Therefore, it is necessary for us to look at and determine what goal God has in his intentions when he urges and calls his children to become warriors in prayer. Also, in what way and upon what conditions is God able and desires to give man the right to become a warrior in prayer so that man may present the interests of God and implement <clears throat> or actualize his inheritance in God. Per the definitions provided in Scripture, to be a warrior in prayer is the lawful and privileged inheritance of holy men of all days. This is their primary or first most purpose that is revealed in their calling to trample upon uncleanness and the unclean in their prayer battles as dirt in the streets. This is one of the greatest positions that is gifted by God to man, in which a person becomes a king and a priest to God, and is seen by God as a brilliant stone, this diamond stone with the name of Naphtali. Not being a king and a priest to God, in the virtue of which a person receives the unique ability and right to reign with his informational organ over his emotional organ, it is impossible to be and remain a warrior in prayer. A warrior in prayer is not is not affected by his emotions and doesn't <clears throat> determine the presence of God with his emotions. 
The informational organ is called to reign over the emotional aspect of the soul. This is the renewed mind of man, renewed by the mind of Christ. The prayer of a warrior in prayer is a sacral or holy mystery that has an unearthly genesis. By its nature, the genesis of prayer as well as the genesis of God does not have a beginning and does not have an end. Prayer is the language of God, identifying the essence of God, the word of God, and the genesis of God. Prayer has always been the mystery of God as it has always existed in His presence. And it has existed as a golden scepter of favor which He stretched forth to the one that would seek His face in performing His will. If, however, anyone dared come to him upon his own personal conditions, not being called into his presence, then God's golden scepter of favor would not stretch forth to the one asking. This, the will of such a person would not be heard. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. John 9.31, in the Temple of Solomon, it was symbolic, temporary. But God did abide them for, abide there for real. And if a priest would have entered in not being called, God would have killed him there. If he unlawfully would enter in, God would physically kill him. And that's why the priests had a lot of fear when the Israelites started stepping away from God, they were very much afraid. Even the ark was missing, but they would enter in still once a year and sprinkle with blood. And they uh, thought of this, of something. They didn't feel that they were uh, worthy or righteous, and so they would tie uh, a string to his foot, to his leg, and if. Uh, to his ankle, and so if if they would no longer hear the bells of his of his uh, garments, that means he would need to be pulled out because he was killed. And so he, they were very much afraid. But the, the fear that the Lord wanted us to have is the kind of fear like two people in love have. Not the fear where you're afraid uh, that God will kill you, but the kind of fear where you love someone unconditionally. So the right to come close to and stand before God in prayer is the exclusive prerogative of God. No one will be able to or will dare by themselves to come close to or approach God who desires to abide in darkness or, mi or mystery and the unapproachable. Light. Jeremiah 30, 21 and 22, their noble shall be from among them, and their governor shall come from their midst. Then I will cause him to draw near, and he shall approach me. For who is this who pledged his heart to approach me, says the Lord? You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Everywhere where the Lord says, the Lord says, the Lord says, you'll say this, you'll see this, then this is actually the name Yahweh. They don't translate. The Jews are uh, are so afraid of the name Yahweh that they replace it with the word Lord. But everywhere where you see says the Lord, it's not Adonai or Lord, but Yahweh that they're afraid to per, uh, speak and write. It's it's written that you will not speak of the name of the Lord your God in vain, but the Lord because the Lord will ask of you and you shall have sin. And because they they speak the name of God in vain, they think that if they replace it with the name Lord or Adonai, that nothing bad will happen. And this name uh, uh, slowly was changed to the name Jehovah. They didn't always, uh, they weren't always able to pronounce uh, Yahweh. And so they, Jehovah, this is the incorrect uh, pronunciation of Yahweh. Although it's hard uh, for us to be convinced, of course, that we uh, sing instead of Jehovah, uh, sing Yahweh. God wants us to pronounce his actual name instead of Jehovah. Being in God's presence is the task of one governor that will come from the nation seed of Abraham. This is the only begotten son of God in the status of the son of man in whom and by whom anyone born from God and seeking God would be able to approach and enter God's presence. 
According to the revelations written in scripture, our prayer and the quality of a warrior in prayer, identified by the virtue of the brilliant stone, needs to be continual, persistent, diligent, with boldness, with reverence, with faith of your heart, with thanksgiving, with joy, in the fear of the Lord, and in the Holy Spirit, or praying in tongues. In the previous services, we've noted that a merry heart identified the state of We've been studying the element of joy and that the merry heart identifies the state of a heart of a warrior in prayer as well as the quality of the warrior's prayer itself. A merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones, Proverbs 17.22. Therefore, one of the signs by which we need to determine the presence of joy that comes from above will be a merry heart that will serve as medis a medicinal substance and healing, restoring and repairing his faith and his trust in God. Not his sicknesses, but his faith. It will heal his faith. It will serve as a medicinal substance to heal his faith. Why can we not receive healing? Because our faith is sick, it's, it's weak. And so a merry heart makes your faith strong and healthy and heal and healed and then our healthy faith if it's a joyful uh, faith it looks into the future and walks upon uh, sickness and says I will not die I will live yes you're sick but you rejoice and say I will not die I will live I will be healed and in this way your faith overcomes the sickness that doesn't mean you won't be sick but that means that uh, there are a lot of uh, Think things a righteous man can go through, but the Lord will deliver us from all of them. A broken spirit is a symbol of a hard heart that is directed by the pride of his unrenewed mind, where there is an absence of an atmosphere of upright joy that deprives God of grounds or foundation to do good and heal this person. And to determine the essence of unearthly joy as well as the conditions that we are needing to fulfill so that we can grow and begin to reveal the presence of it in our prayers, we've been introduced to four aspects defining the essence and purpose of the fruit of joy in prayer, the price of obtaining and expressing the fruit of joy, keeping and developing the fruit of joy, the fruits and rewards of expressing upright joy in prayer. Looking at the first question, what qualities does supernatural joy have and what purpose is covered in the spring from which the unearthly joy flows? We conclude that in scripture, the quality or character that is included in the word joy, as with the previous qualities, is prescribed in prayer as a commandment, as a decree and order, as an urgent military command that is bef to be fulfilled without deviation. If this order is not fulfilled, the verdict is death or a final split or break of our relationship contained in the covenant you made with God. Apostle Paul, concluding his short book to the Church of Christ, gave the quality of joy its own elevation and rank as an integrity integral part of our salvation in Christ Jesus. Jude 124, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Looking at the above mentioned place of scripture, we can conclude that for God, fault or blemish and joy is an absence of a, of a foundation keeping him from stumbling into perdition to present us before his glory. The glory of God abides exclusively in the atmosphere of upright joy and is an expression of this upright joy. Blemishes or sin and joy is a stain or flaw revealing impurity, abomination and deceit. A person who has not rid himself of such blemishes and joy, as well as in all his other characteristics, will not be allowed in heaven. But there shall by no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, Revelation 21, 27. We know that, you know that Jerusalem is in three places. It's in heaven, and a part of the holy people are already there. It's on earth. That's the Church of Jesus Christ, and it is in the heart of a person as well, in these three places. And in this Jerusalem, nothing that defiles will be able to enter. And so you can sit in one church and not enter, not be a partaker of this new Jerusalem, this new person. 
Determining the wellspring of unearthly joy and the existing in this joy natural qualities, we conclude that upright joy in prayer can come only from an upright heart of a man. The heart expresses this upright joy. Our words and our actions manifest this state of upright joy. If within our heart we will abide within the atmosphere of upright joy, then our prayer will express this joy. We need to differentiate earthly or regular joy from joy that is supernatural. The supernatural joy has its distinctive roots in God, its distinctive wellspring in God, and its distinctive genesis in God. By themselves, the two natures of joy are two programs that come from different nature springs, God and the fallen cherubim. The heart of a man is a programmable system that and that nature of joy to which man gives his consideration or preference dresses him and rules his, his nature and his essence. And if we consider our or prefer earthly joy, then it from one side will be the means we measure our relationship with God, and from the other side will be suppressing and depressing supernatural joy. When we fast, the body is in sorrow. A person walks sorrowful, he cannot rejoice. Some people I know at the time of fast, they don't, they're not just sorrowful, they become angry. I remember... Uh, uh, my stepmother, my mother had passed away and my father remarried, and so when she fasted, she'd become so angry uh, she can even break dishes or she'll make a lot of noise and the father always asked her uh, please don't fast because you're going to break everything in this place this is just an example and so I know a lot of people that at the time of fasting, uh, the spirit rejoices, but you didn't experience that joy because of the, of the difficult moment cause, because you want to eat and you just want to wait until it's evening so you can actually eat. <clears throat> And so just to show that sometimes this, this is a joy of a different, different, just to show that this joy is of a different type of joy, not feeling. Due to its supernaturalism, unearthly joy is not able to be experienced or felt upon the level of our physical abilities. As unlike worldly joy, it isn't a kind of emotion or a kind of feeling that lifts our mood. But it can lead your feelings when, uh, when they're when you uh, when they're obedient. <clears throat> and so when our emotions are disciplined, then it's able to actually follow. And so when these feelings will be disciplined of the mind and heart, which creates peace in the heart of a man, then the feeling may uh, experience. Uh, uh, a, a type of medicine and joy in the heart. Therefore, upright joy is a as a component of prayer is the confession of the faith of the heart, that in power is equal to the power of the words that come out of the mouth of God. They come from our entrails and are directed towards eternal life. According to the revelations of Scripture, overwhelming joy that is included in the consistency of continual prayer is one of the unearthly qualities and names of God himself, and of course the children that are born from him. This quality of joy may be received by these children in no other way but only in the seat of the word of grace in the Holy Spirit, and only after be grown and enabled by the means of the discipline of the will, mind, and heart, directed continually to abide in the word of God and meditating about the word of God and the Holy Spirit. Therefore, supernatural joy in its genesis as well as, as its expression <coughs> is stable, continual, unchanging, and absolutely does not depend from worldly circumstances or obtaining materialistic goods, either obtaining them or losing them. Identifying unearthly joy, that, that the triumphing of the wicked is short and the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment, Job 25. The joy that they have is short, but and, and sometimes you'll see a person laughing and then suddenly begins to cry. 
Unearthly joy is stable and does not change. Proverbs 14, 13, even in laughter the heart may sorrow and in the end of, end of mirth may be grief. But unearthly joy, there will not be any sorrow or grief. It will be continually joyful. Regarding men with unclean hearts and hands that filled the church back then as well as today, Apostle Paul states, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. James 4, 9. This means that forgiving preference to worldly joy that men choose over joy that comes from above, God will bring man to judgment. Ecclesiastes 11, 9. Rejoice, o, o young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the day of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these God will bring you into judgment. Turning our attention to the unique wisdom of Scripture in defining unearthly joy, we've decided to look at the virtues of upright joy only within the heart of a man, a person born from the imperishable seed of the word of truth abiding within Christ. And since the first spring of upright joy is God himself, specifically it is God who is the example and criteria identifying the quality and nature of upright joy. Therefore, the upright joy is not only the quality of, of God and the atmosphere in which God abides, it is also one of His glorious names with which He triumphs over His enemies. Psalm 43, 4, 5, Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and on the harp I will praise you, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. So question two, what requirements are needing to be fulfilled to obtain and demonstrate the fruit of joy in our prayers before God? And of course, the method by which joy is obtained in prayer or the price gets paid is in the prayer itself. Since prayer is the means of communication or the means of conversation with God, and God is the wellspring of joy. Being crucified upon the cross, Jesus turned to his Father with this prayer. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. John 17:13. He, in prayer, turned to his Father so that his disciples would have in him this perfect joy. Turning to his disciples, Jesus speaking to them so that they would have within themselves his perfect joy, he taught them to pray to the Father in his name so that they can receive his grace. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. John 16, 24. <coughs> And so when will the joy be full? When the children of God begin to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ, not in the name of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These names, you can study these names and understand them, but God says we need to pray in the name of Jesus Christ. We are connected to Abraham through Jesus Christ. Remember, there was a person here that continually tried to contradict uh, this thing. I always said, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. This person would come out and say, Father, in the, uh, uh, Lord, in the name of, the, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I prayed about this man asking, uh, God, what's going on with this brother? And and he, he always said, did it in such a way as if he wanted to uh, disagree with praying in the name of the Son, in, in the name of Jesus Christ. <coughs> He didn't teach the disciples. They did pray and prayed in the name of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they needed to, he taught them to pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And Apostle Paul and the rest, you see that they later they prayed in the name of Jesus Christ after Jesus taught them that. Therefore, the means and instrument for receiving and developing unearthly joy within yourself is continual prayer that is done in accordance to the 12 requirements that are contained within the 12 precious stones of the breastplate of judgment mounted into 12 golden settings of the true word. Therefore, any element contained within the price for obtaining unearthly joy is called to be accomplished in continual prayer, and by continual prayer that satisfies the requirements of the breastplate of judgment. I will bring forth 12 elements in the price by which we can receive this joy, although there are many more of them, but I think 12 will be enough.
The first element in the price for receiving and demonstrating upright joy, it doesn't, it doesn't make a difference in which order these will be. It's just one of the elements in the price for receiving and demonstrating upright joy in continual prayer consists of obtaining an upright heart, because upright joy can only come from an upright heart. Jude 124.25 now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. <clears throat> to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. And so upright, an upright heart, what is this upright heart? This is the good heart in which are two great witnesses that stand before God of all the earth, in the virtue of the Thummim, which is the teaching of Christ, and the Urim, which is the Holy Spirit revealing the mysteries of the Thummim. Ecclesiastes 2.26, For God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man who is good in his sight, but to the sinner he gives the work of gathering and collecting person with a good heart or who is upright in heart one who is good before his face he gives him wisdom and knowledge and joy in the heart of all the wise I'll put if the gifted artisans he put his knowledge his wisdom but to the sinner he gives the work of gathering and collecting that he may give to him who is good before God this is also this is a very beautiful place of scripture for God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man who is good and in his sight but to the sinner he gives the work of gathering and collecting that he may give it to him who is good before God this is also vanity and grasping for the wind for the sinner you know how there are people who are uh, extremely they're famous or wealthy sometimes they get so busy so busy that they can't even enjoy food and they have all these protectors around them and in the end they either kill themselves so they they have no joy it is, it is every time that the virtue that is addressed or listed, we more than once have noted a consistent pattern in Scripture. This is that every time when Scripture unites any inherent to God characteristics, qualities and virtues with the pretext word and, it is every time that the virtue that is addressed or listed first is always and without question a certain spring that will contain within itself and from which will flow the following or next virtues. Therefore, the wisdom that comes from God is always and without question providing supernatural knowledge that comes from the wisdom of God, always containing and carrying celebration of an unearthly joy. Matthew 25, 24 through 30, Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look there, you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said, You wicked and lazy servant, you know that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the banker, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. To take the ta so take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he was he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Looking at the given parable, we conclude that a person that buried the silver of his salvation into the ground is in the likeness of the sinner that gathered and saved to afterwards give to the man that is good before the face of God, who turned his silver of salvation that was trusted to him by God to profit. You, you experience, you see here that this is a parable. It's talking about unearthly wealth. A person that is good, he gives wisdom and knowledge and joy. You see what the wealth is, wisdom, knowledge, and joy. This is the wealth that he gives. To the sinner, he gives them the work of gathering to then give to the good one before his face. He buried his talent and was uh, afraid, always thinking, oh, just so I don't sin, just so I don't sin. This is all he had in his mind. I buried this into the ground. If I'm saved, this is enough. 
uh, just to survive the next day, to, uh, or at least to get to the uh, porch of, of the kingdom. They have no joy because they, why do I, do I need all of this, they say. Uh, children of God, the, the more you give them the word, the more you give them knowledge, the more joy will flow. This is wealth, but they don't want this wealth. To receive the right to possess within your heart upright joy in prayer, it is necessary to prepare your heart into good soil. When will your heart be good? When you have good soil, a heart ready to receive and grow the planted word. This implies a humble heart. Not when we come as inspectors, but as students. Psalm 65, 9 through 13. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You, this, of course, is not talking about this uh, physical world, that he visits the earth and uh, uh, water it and greatly enrich it. The river of enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their, their grain. And so the truth becomes our food. For so you have prepared, you water its ridges abundantly, you settle its furrows, you make it soft with, sh with showers, you bless its growth. You settle its furrows, you make it soft with showers, this blessing of God makes our heart soft and compassionate. That's what it's talking about, the soil of your heart. A good heart is a good soil. You crown the year with your goodness, and your paths drip with abundance. Your paths within the heart of a person uh, drip with abundance, drip with anointing. They drop on the pastures of the wilderness, and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys are also covered with grain. They shout for joy. They also sing. We perfectly understand that it's talking about the valleys and, and the hills and the sheep. This is all in the heart of a person. When his hills, the little hills were rejoicing and the pasture were clothed with flocks. When, it's talking here about the, the small flocks. It's talking about sheep and goats. And sheep and goats are a symbol of a pure mind or pure thinking. The pastures are clothed with flocks. Our heart uh, begins to be clothed into good God's uh, mentality, God's way of thinking, the renewed mind. <coughs> And the valleys are also covered with grain. We begin to receive the revelation of God. <coughs> and because of these revelations, we begin to rejoice. Hebrews 6, 4 through 8, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the power of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance. People who already have become the carriers of the Urim and the Thummim received the teaching into their heart and the Holy Spirit and then fell away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame for the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those who by whom it's cultivated receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to, to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. Thorns and briars are materialistic prosperity. When people, due to materialistic prosperity, leave the Lord, leave the church, leave the pastor, leave just to find some kind of a wealth, riches to prove something to themselves, although there are a lot of places in Scripture that you can't per, uh, even uh, pretend. There are a lot of very large churches, even I know of, and these pastors are uh, affected by a government because they brought a lot of people to God and 
The main idea there is materialistic prosperity to become wealthy. Look at the, the, the Church of Yang Cho. Everything is a, a, about wealth and prosperity. When you go into the internet, and if there are churches there that say, come, and God will bless you, if you're poor, you will become wealthy. You don't know that God will bless you if you're sick he will heal you and so forth they give you all worldly things and offer offering worldly things and all of this are thorns and bruises this all will be burned whose end is to be burned it says second element in the price for receiving and developing unearthly and perfect joy within yourself by the means of continual prayer is fulfilling specific conditions giving us the right to abide within God and the right to allow God to abide within us John 15 7 through 12. If you abide in me and my word abide in you, you will ask, ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Look at the price. If you will abide in me and my words abide in you. <clears throat> how can we abide in him when we begin to meditate about something we begin to abide in whatever we're thinking about how do we abide in God when we begin to meditate about the word of God we begin to submerge ourselves into the word of God if we're meditating meditating and thinking about worldly things and worrying about worldly things we submerge ourselves into worldly things if we come and meditate about worldly things <clears throat> and think about how we're going to become uh, richer here or uh, improve our worldly living. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you, a what you desire and it shall be done for you. But when you abide in him, then you will only desire what the Lord desires. We're not abiding in our own desires, but in the desires of God. God's words are God's desires. And then what do we ask? We ask then what is, we ask God's will and not our own will. Often, people take this place of scripture, they read it. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you, what you desire and it shall be done for you. And then they pervert this and say, whatever you may desire, ask and it will be yours. <clears throat> but first we read that our desires are not here. If we abide in the word and it abides in us, then our desires will be the word of God, the desire of the word, the will of God, the goals of God. The goals of God become our goals. And we begin to pray about God's goals and pursue God's goals. We are uh, then inspired by this and ask whatever the Lord desires. And then my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. And the fruit is not step, stepping away until you receive what is asked for. If I know that this is the will of God and God wants this, right now we preach the will of God. God wants for us to be dressed into our new person, but look how quickly the, f the flesh grabs and the takes the initiative here. People say, so when will we finally be dressed? When will this happen? You see that they want this so that uh, all their, old, uh, their aging would stop and that they he be healed and feel better. You see that they're caring again about their flesh. And this is dangerous. You hear, and the Father is glorified when we bear much fruit. When you do it for, when we do it for Him and not for ourselves, we need to care about being dressed so that the Lord may be glorified. Because when a person says, "I have no sickness," I'll be, I'll be young, and then I'll be able to prove what I believed in. What kind of promises I received from the Lord? 
That's not the purpose of all that. You need to understand that you will be dressed into your new person to fulfill the will of God. This is God's will that the Father be glorified, and not you be glorified, but the Father be glorified. When you abide in God's word, you suddenly see the will of God, what God wants. He wants you to be as he is, perfect in his likeness. And then you uh, began to strive to fulfill God's will and look to how God's will can be fulfilled. And then he says, you will, then you will be my disciples. Then you will be able to learn. You will be my disciples. When you will be uh, striving to fulfill my will. And as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. And if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. I have, uh, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. He says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. And he says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. When we rise above our fleshly sympathies and, uh, and our dislikes, towards other people one is attracted to us one isn't we try to avoid those that aren't very attractive but love as I have loved you I loved you not selectively like who is attractive to me and who isn't I took you with your different characters I loved you and I've loved you how I saw you in you the character of my father and loved my, the character of my father in you I didn't love your character I loved the character of my father in you. I saw it in you. And I saw what can happen within you when you die for your character, then the character of the father will begin to show. It's important to understand how to abide in the word of God and examine ourselves whether we abide in them. If I want to do something or so for the Lord to do something for me as the will of God, then I abide in his love. If I wait for something as for myself, Lord, it's my inheritance. I want to be dressed into my inheritance. This is God's inheritance, God's heritage that he gave us. When we pray for healing, we need to ask of our healing as the will of God. Lord, your will is that I be healed because you paid the price for my healing with your son and your son died. And you placed upon my account the healing that is in your son. If it will not be fulfilled why then did he die you see the lord suffers that he cannot heal as he wants to not as he we want to but as he wants to if you don't heal me today i don't want it tomorrow that's i know people saying this i don't need it tomorrow i need it right now they say it openly i heard preachers who actually said that and when they would say such things people would applaud them he said uh, to god if you don't heal my finger uh, right now then i i will go away or they tell every brother and sisters put him into a fifth corner trip uh, put him in a, in a in a uncomfortable spot because he's a, uh, affected by his word and he can't get uh, do anything out of it and I, I've, I was so uncomfortable with what he said I, I became so angry with what he said I knew that this was wrong and he, I had a really big desire to uh, to actually hit him, but I knew I could, cannot do something like that, and I wouldn't do it, but that desire came about uh, because of the anger I had because of what he said. I just allowed the Lord to judge, and uh, as the Lord said, vengeance is mine. 
The Lord has his word and he has uh, submitted himself to his word, you know, uh, behave according to his word. If you say, I want it right now, and if you don't do it right now, you are not asking for his will, you're asking it for yourself to satisfy your own will. And so if we want to truly receive this joy, the price that we need to pay, we need to abide in God and allow God to abide in us by his word. Every time when we meditate about his word, we submerge ourselves into God and to his word. And in this way, we give God the right to abide within us, and we, and we abide in Him. And then the Holy Spirit can come and reveal His secrets. When, can, when does it come? When we begin to meditate about the meaning of His truth. What, what, can, what can God mean when He said this? And it's very important that things that our mind cannot uh, capture or grasp, uh, not, not that a person be impatient saying, I want it right now, but when we're humble and say, Lord, when you reveal your truth, when you find it good, you know, the Arabic and uh, African kings uh, that are in those countries, when you uh, come to those to their to their court. You sit. You sit at his gates, and he can see. He he sees you're there, but he can receive you only. And sometimes you, you'll have to wait four days a week. He knows you're there, but he will only uh, listen to you if he if he's in the mood. It's not at the European presidents. They behave in a different way. They write to him and say, Dear President, you have 7, 7 o'clock, 7.30, you have a, an, an, an appointment, and he is required to, to, to uh, be there. But these kings uh, don't, don't behave that way. God is uh, binded to his word, and he will do it when he wants to, when we put ourselves in, in, in the long suffering of the Lord and wait and say Lord I don't know when or what but I know that you want this and I thank you it's written that they will rejoice in long suffering I will wait as long as I need to wait it's pleasant just to come to you and tell you this and wait it's pleasant to me I don't have any I don't have an impatience thinking when will you do it I already have the wealth that I can come to you and wait I know that I'm waiting for your for your word and I know I already have it and when you he sees this he he responds and sometimes he he waits before he responds by doing this he uh, allows your fruit to grow the old begins to fade away more and more and more and then the fruit begins to mature better and if you remember he did this with Abraham Abraham began to trust God even more and that's when God came and told him, after a year you'll have a child, and uh, within a year Sarah and Abraham became young and bore the Isaac that they waited for. The third element in the price for receiving and developing unearthly and perfect joy within yourself by the means of continual prayer is finding a place where God desires to dwell. Psalm 43, 3 and 4. Oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. To be upon God's holy hill, you need God's light and you need his truth so that they may lead me upon this holy hill in his taber to his tabernacle. Then I will go to the altar of God to God my exceeding joy, and on the harp I will praise you, O God, my God. In the original it says, and upon the harp I will reveal the mysteries that are upon my heart. 
the harp, the inner, the heart, it sings to God. It rejoices because a person has uh, ended up upon the hill of God, there where God desires to be, where he desires to dwell. Searching the meaning of the given place of Scripture in Hebrew, the version of the given translated place of Scripture, sounds something like this. I take the definitions of uh, that are in Hebrew, and sometimes uh, the Holy Spirit will give me a revelation to uh, certain places of Scripture. Because the translation that we read, uh, were these translations were done by people that were not God-inspired, just uh, regular translators. Reveal your light in me and open to me the truth that is contained within my heart. Let them lead me and bring me to your holy hill and the place of your dwelling. And when I will go to the banquet of my God, <clears throat> I will forget my complaints and the sorrows of my soul. In God is my exceeding joy and gladness. This is the version of this place of scripture. We know that the altar of God and the places of God's dwelling upon the holy hill where all offerings brought by him are sanctified is the wellspring of our joy and the guarantee of our salvation. Specifically, the altar of God is the spring of our joy and the guarantee of our salvation, and it is upon the hill of God, upon the place where God dwells. And to find it, we know that the symbol of the altar upon the holy hill is a symbol of our focuses or aspirations, determining what we seek in knowing God, linked to our dedication to God, in God's place of dwelling, the body of Christ. The mountain of God, the hill of God, is the body of Christ. This is where God abides. To find this church. He says, send your truth and your light. Sometimes people say, how do I need to choose? There are a lot of churches. If you truly are seeking where the Lord is, you will not be able to determine by yourself. But if you will stand upon your knees and say, Lord, in this city, there's 3,000 churches. In Portland, we have at least 3,000 churches, Christian churches. Imagine how many churches we have. Which one do you go to? Where is God? He can be in many and he can be in not be in many. And even if he is, that doesn't mean I can go to any place where he abides. I need to go where he wants me to go, where he will call me. I need to pray and say sincerely before the Lord, send me a revelation and the desire of where I, can, where I should go, where you would like to see me. Because send your light and your truth, and they shall lead me and shall bring me to your holy hill and your tabernacle. The light of the Lord. We know that when we go to this church, we will have need to have light. What kind of church does it need to be? This church needs to be have the teaching of Jesus Christ taught. Today there are churches that are called uh, the churches of a whole gospel or a perfect gospel. They say we believe that a person is born again, he's saved. We believe that the Lord baptizes, baptizes with the Holy Spirit. We believe that God heals and that he will come again. These are the four truths that they say they believe in. <clears throat> this is a, a large church and it's a Pentecostal church uh, that, that presents these four uh, things they believe in, truth they believe in, but they're all for the flesh. God heals. They don't mean that God saves, that God saves uh, to there. They, they, the salvation, the word salvation, they don't understand fully. They don't have the teaching of Christ that came in the flesh. They don't have the full truth. They consider full truth is this perfect truth, the complete truth, uh, 
как она могла сформулировать полную истину, будучи евангелисткой, не будучи учителем, не будучи апостолом. Was presented this teaching, so-called teaching, was presented by a, an evangelist woman, uh, one who is not a pastor. She's just a person who goes and calls people to repent uh, and brings people to God uh, so that they then find themselves churches. But she herself created a church. Many evangelists create their own churches, not being called as pastors or teachers, begin to call themselves prophets and teachers and so called forth, but they don't have the teaching of, of God. God. They say God saves, God baptizes, God heals, and God will return again. These are all true, but when you know what church you're, you want to be in, and when you pray, then God will direct you to that church where the true gospel is preached, the entire gospel of Christ that came in the flesh, where the Godhead is presented as well. And then you will understand that the Holy Spirit works, send your light and your truth, and they shall lead me and bring me. Only the true light and the revelation of the Holy Spirit, revealing the meaning of all truth within our heart, will bring us to a relationship with the holy hill upon which God dwells, as not every hill in its natural essence is a holy hill of God, but only that hill upon which God wants to dwell and that God loves. You know, there are a lot of hills, and today they call them generals of God and large movements and large churches. But in Scripture, this hill are the narrow gate, the bride of the Lamb, or the chosen by God remaining flock. And if a person using all his energy or efforts enters the narrow gate, then he becomes a partaker of the holy hill. Let's read this place of scripture, Psalm 68, 13 through 16. Though you lie down among the sheepfolds, when God sent his truth, you asked for it, you knew what you were asking for, so that they bring you to such a church. And when God will bring you to such a church, it shall be your place. Though you lie down among the sheepfolds, you will be like the wings of a dove covered with silver and her feathers with yellow gold. When the Almighty scattered kings in it, it was white as snow in Zalmon. A mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan. A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Why do you fume with envy, you mountains of many peaks? This is the mountain which God desires to dwell in it. Yes, the Lord will dwell in it forever. The mountain of Bashan is a translated as soft, fertile soil, which implicates good soil of the heart, able to receive and grow seed of the preached word about the kingdom of heaven. The king that God scatters in his, pl in his place are sins that previously ruled over us. His place in which he scatters is our heart. As it is written, there, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. So these kings, these sins, when God will scatter these sins within the heart of a person has delivered this heart, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey in it in its lusts and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God Romans 6 12 13 therefore the snow upon the heights of the mountain of Bashan within our heart is a symbol of our deadness for sin which is a testimony that we died for our nation for our house and for our personal desires that were the producers of sin producers of these kings and when God had scattered these kings, then she became white as snow. When we talk about the elevation of Mount Zion, which is also the joy for our whole earth, because on that our whole earth means the soil of our heart, this doesn't mean the earth here, the physical earth. There's no joy for this earth. Their, their joy here is in materialistic things. <clears throat> Mount Zion, because on her northern side is the city of the great king. This city is Jerusalem and our, par <clears throat> and our pa partaking of it. Beautiful and elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north the city of the great king, Psalm 48, 2. Looking at this place of scripture to obtain and demonstrate upright joy in prayer, it is necessary to have an organic membership to the great Jerusalem that is located on the northern side of Mount Zion. Jerusalem is the chosen by, by God flock. And so the northern side... <clears throat> 
is the place of the cross, the teaching of the cross. That's where God begins to break <coughs> the old nature, which is sin. Not the blood of, of, Christ, of Christ destroys this nature, but the cross. <coughs> in accordance to this place of Scripture, to obtain and demonstrate upright joy in prayer, it is necessary to have an organic membership to this great Jerusalem. But you be glad and rejoice forever in what I create, for behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people to joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Isaiah 65, 18, 19. And so when you're a partaker of Jerusalem, uh, God has created as, as his joy and gladness. First, to be a partaker of Jerusalem, that is the chosen by God flock, and as a result become a partaker of the joy of heaven, it is necessary to be sanctified or repent, because a person who repents in his sins of his nation, in the sins of his fathers, and in his own personal sins, gives the Heavenly Father great joy as well as all the hosts of heaven. We need to keep in mind that when we are talking about a repenting sinner, this refers to the lost sheep, <coughs> which is an analog to the lost son from another parable of Christ. <coughs> and in the original, there's no word uh, as a repenting sinner. It's a repenting person. <coughs> the, the translators translated a repenting sinner. A sheep cannot be a, a sinner. She by nature is different. It can be dirty uh, <coughs> with sin, but she's not a sinner. It's one who is a, a sinner is one not born from God. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing, and when he becomes, when he comes home, he calls together his, fr his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. This is a sheep that was in the flock and then had somehow got lost in his way. A sheep will never criticize the pastor. She can get lost, but she will not criticize because she's a sheep. As soon as a person begins to criticize, then he is uh, actually a wolf. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just, just persons who, who, with no need for repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angel of God over the one sinner who repents. Luke 15, 3-10. through Again, the translators translated that one sinner who repents. This is talking about one lost person person who repents in, in the original when a person gets lost he can always repent uh, uh, a wolf will never return if a person has transformed himself into a, a wolf he won't return a sheep is is, is a animal that usually is in a flock she quietly will uh, go in itself, maybe quietly uh, disappear from for some reason and get lost. She cannot live without the flock, but a wolf doesn't need a flock. He can live alone if he is in. If he if he uh, sees a flock of land, of sheep, he will destroy all the sheep. A lion, he doesn't destroy everybody in the flock. He usually will just attack the one, and he gets full, and he will lay and be happy. 
and sheep can walk uh, close to him and he won't do anything because he's not he's not hungry anymore a wolf is, is not enough to have the one sheep he will want to destroy the he'll start going to everyone have you heard did you know this did you hear this about this person you've experienced this much i'm sure when a wolf would uh uh r- arise and would go around uh, telling everybody things and so this is talking about the lost uh, sheep again the one that repents is the one person that repents is that lost sheep second to be a partaker of Jerusalem it is necessary to be fed and satisfied with the consolation of her bosom drink deeply and be delighted with the abundance of her glory rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her all you who love her rejoice for for joy with her all who are who mourn for her that you may feed and be satisfied with the consolation of her bosom that you may drink deeply and be delighted with the abundance of her glory Isaiah 66 10 11 we need to keep in mind that the chosen by God flock becomes a joy and gladness first for God God always rejoices for joy in the midst of those whom he loves the Lord your God in your midst the mighty one will save he will rejoice over you with gladness he will quiet you with his love he will rejoice over you with singings <clears throat> Zephaniah 3:17. third to be a partaker of Jerusalem it is necessary to not forsake your assembly his partaker the chosen by God flock not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as it is in the manner of some but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful expectation of judgment a fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be? That worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insults the Spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hand of the living God. Hebrews 10, 25 through 31. A church where the order of theocracy is replaced with a profane to God order of democracy is unable to offer a full or complete teaching of Christ. Therefore, such a church does not have the right to be called an assembly of saints and is more likely a synagogue of Satan. I think for today this was enough. Uh, we will bend our knees, our heads, whoever, however, who is comfortable, and we will thank God for who He is for us, what He has done for us. Amen. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I turn to you in the midst of your nation, in the midst of your people, in the place where you have chosen for the worshiping of your holy name. Rejoice gladly, Lord, and allow us to rejoice. Allow your people to understand what your joy is and that what needs to be done to be able to rejoice with a joy that is endless to speak it in our prayers so that you may dress us into the new person created in accordance to God in Christ Jesus. We thank you because this is your will. You want to glorify your great name. You want to rejoice. You want to see your children who strive to fulfill your will, to bring joy to your heart, not to just be uh, delivered from the burden of pain, but to satisfy your heart because they love you but your heart will be glad when we will bear you much fruit the bearing of fruit is dressing ourselves into our new person and so do according to your will the great will of yours dress your nation your inheritance into the fruit of the spirit that they bear to you and may their words of their of their mouth be a glory in which you will dress them may they catch themselves into the words of their own mouth confessing that your principles your commandments your statutes we thank you father that we continue in perseverance with joy wait when you will finally reveal your glory 
glory and when you will hear the confessions of your people and dress them into their confessions, when you will glorify your son, Jesus Christ, when you will show the difference between those who serve you and those who don't serve you. May your mercy be blessed for your holy nation now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us proclaim our unchanging manifestation now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever. Amen.